Let's talk about this with someone that knows all about fuel poverty because he is uh, part of the End Fuel Poverty Coalition, Simon Francis. Simon, thanks for joining me on Talk this afternoon. What do you make of this vote today? Well, it's a grim day for those pensioners who will be missing out on the winter fuel payments um, for you know the, the first time um, in in many many years. And and what the impact of that is is that those pensioners who who got the winter fuel payment last year and also other support that the government had in place um, and are not going to get it this year are actually going to see the highest energy bills that they'll have ever faced in their lives that that's the reality of the decision that has been made today and whilst you know we support what the government's doing long term in terms of more renewables warm homes plan to insulate buildings that's all really good stuff but we need to not forget those people who are going to be facing this winter with the prospect now of living in cold damp homes because they simply can't afford to keep them warm and and the problem with that especially with older people especially with those people who've got pre-existing health conditions or disabilities is that living in those conditions makes matters worse it forces them into the arms of the already stretched uh, NHS and, and we know that sadly um, people do actually die as a result of living in cold damp conditions. Well, well, Simon, and Labour, those Labour themselves, well, the, the, the hideous irony of this is Labour themselves, Keir Starmer himself said in 2017 when he thought that the Conservatives might withdraw this particular payment to pensioners, he said their research, the Labour Party's research, said that 4,000 pensioners might die directly as a consequence of this. I mean, and how can they live with themselves knowing that, knowing that they produced that research themselves and have now, you know, 348 of them have voted to withdraw that payment? It, it's quite incredible. And do you also, do you buy the mitigation from Keir Starmer today that, well, it's OK because we are increasing the state pension by a slightly higher amount because of the triple lock, which on and off has been in place for years, decades. That, that's not a Keir Starmer thing. Um, he was doing that anyway. So for him, in my opinion, to say, well, that is mitigation, it's not, because he'd already decided to restore and maintain the triple lock. I mean, it's a pretty flimsy argument on his part, don't you think? Well, and let's remember the whole point of why the triple lock exists in the, play, in the, in the way that it does is, to, is about the wider cost of living crisis that pensioners have been facing for uh, a long period. In fact, you know, obviously the whole population has been facing for the last few years. You know, the winter fuel payment was specifically about energy bills. It's specifically about trying to keep people warm, trying to keep people away from the NHS in the winter, because we all know the pressures that the NHS is under during the winter months. That's why it was introduced. That's why it is so important. And that's why it's so important, especially for those pensioners who will just now miss out. Um, you know, the, the, the pension credit that is now the gateway to this payment is is a is an arbitrary number that has been dreamt up by uh, by civil servants. And if you're a pound over that limit in terms of your income, you're not getting anything. Well, we heard from those earlier the, on that there's, really there's, there's two pounds over that limit. So you know that 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 hardly puts her into the uh, the realms of millionaire pensioners. I mean, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but how many pensioners genuinely are going to struggle? Those those that are not getting the pension credit and those that are not sufficiently wealthy. That kind of gap in the middle and how many pensioners do you think might fall into that that trap where they genuinely are going to be in fuel poverty this winter well i we think around 1.6 million uh, pensioners will fall into technical fuel poverty as a result of, of this and actually really struggling in cold damp homes um, you know we know research that was out this week that you know, the majority the vast majority of pensions who are classified as living in poverty will now no longer get the winter fuel payment but there's also then another group of around two million um, pensioners who will still struggle they were probably just about managing um, so you know these are huge numbers of people who are going to be suffering this winter uh, all of them are going to be having to make cutbacks uh, either in terms of their heating or in terms of you know, the number of hot meals that they're having you know it, it, the, the picture that we saw last year that we've talked about um you know for, for, for the last few years in terms of the struggles that people have gone through um, there's going to be more people in those situations and, and that's why you know mps really have to examine their conscience and they have to examine um their mailbags uh, i know you were talking about this earlier but you know there has been thousands we know there have been thousands and thousands of letters and emails sent by people over the last few weeks personal stories 
pensioners concerned about and scared about this winter. You know, we have to see action by the Chancellor in the budget to introduce more mitigations so that we don't have a situation where pensioners are unable to stay warm this winter. And, and do you think, Simon, that that will happen? So do you think that on October the 30th, when Rachel Rees stands up at the dispatch box for the first time, there'll be in effect a U-turn over this? Because th th this is not going away, whether it be post bags, whether it be the media talking about it, whether it be remonstrations, you know, peaceful remonstrations against members of parliament. This is going to grow and grow and grow. This bitterness, this, this feeling of being betrayed by a callous Labour government is not going to go away. So do we think that effectively what might happen, as often happens with politicians, is that they cause the damage by way of the announcement and the vote, which is what's just happened, but then they realise, because they're so cloth-eared and didn't realise this in the first place, that they need to walk back a bit. And do you think that's what Rachel Rees might do in, in the budget? I guess you hope that she does. Well, that's it. We're just left with hope, aren't we? We can only hope that the, the MPs and, and cabinet ministers see sense and actually understand the harm they're doing. You know, Wes Streeting as health secretary, he should know the pressure that the NHS is now going to be under as a result of this. Liz Kendall at Work and Pensions will know the fact that the, the pensions credit helpline is, is, over, is, is overrun with people trying to get hold of um, pension credit in time for, for this winter. You know, the ministers will have to stand up to the Chancellor and will have to be counted and say, we need to put in more Simon, it's not, it's not um, going to happen. Prevent. Politically, it's not going to happen this early in a government, in a parliament, because, of course, you know, this is why Keir Starmer didn't want to vote on this in the first place, because he doesn't want a rebellion, because, of course, it's a very, very bad indication of, uh, of his tenure. Uh, the, the fact that he's had 53... MPs abstain and one vote against him. I mean, that, that is, let's be very clear on this, that is a rebellion. Uh, if it wasn't a rebellion, those 54 Labour MPs would have voted with him. So he's already seen a significant rebellion, whatever that is, 15% of the Labour parliamentary party. Um, and, and the other thing, of course, that shouldn't be lost on us, whilst this is going on, while we're seeing uh, a saving of a billion pounds, Simon, as, as the Chancellor and Keir Starmer put it, uh, because of this so-called black hole, let's not go into that, no pun intended. But at the same time, we've got the gurning bacon sandwich eating Ed, Ed Miliband running around the country, by the way, in jets and in petrol and diesel cars, uh, trying to ensure that we turn off oil and gas for all of us altogether in a few years' time, um, and that the solution, the replacement, the alternative for that is windmills and solar panels. Now, it doesn't matter kind of what side of the green debate you're on, but the fact that that's going to cost tens, maybe hundreds of billions of pounds in terms of infrastructure and indeed subsidies, because obviously these things don't stand on their own two feet financially, we, we seem to be able to spend 20, 30, 40 billion pounds on a flawed, pointless uh, move over to sustainable energy whilst being quite happy with our consciences, or the Labour government are, that pensioners that are potentially dying, that have paid into the system for years and years and years, that, that it's OK to treat them in this way. I mean, that, that is a circle that surely can't be squared, isn't it? I'm not sure I completely agree with your categorisation there in terms of the renewables. I mean, that, that is part of one of the things that is going to bring down prices in the long run. Um, you know, and as well, you know, we've, we've talked as well before about the warm homes plan um, that is going to help insulate homes. You know, we do support those things, but they are going to take time to come through. And what we can't do is is leave people behind in cold, damp homes whilst we wait for these long-term solutions um, to come on stream. So that's why you know we need to see both um, support for you know kind of getting us off you know international wholesale markets. I mean that's what's driving the cost of you know when you talk about. Uh, oil and gas is one of the reasons the energy crisis has been so bad for us is because we are so reliant on on the gas international wholesale prices we need to find ways of improving our energy security and people will obviously have uh, debates about the best way of going about that but regardless of how we get to a better more energy secure system with more renewables what we need to do is not lose sight of the fact that people are hurting right now what? and are going to suffer as a result of the decisions that have been made today I, I don't think there's a single pensioner in britain will be listening to this saying well 
well, OK, I've lost the ability to heat my home for a few weeks during the winter, but it's OK because I can be heartened by the fact that Ed Miliband is erecting a few windmills and some solar panels, so everything will be OK, won't it? Uh, I don't suppose that there's a wave of that sentiment across Britain uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Simon, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Uh, Simon Francis from the End Fuel Poverty Coalition. Uh, let's see what you think about this. Lots and lots of people have been calling and texting. Uh, 0344 of course, uh, for the final 45 minutes of the show. Um, let's speak to Richard in Wigan, who I think has something to say about pensioners, Richard, don't you? Uh, yeah, hello, Russell. Thanks Hi. for uh, thanks for sort of having me on, the, on your show. Um, it, it's a previous caller, actually, that made me think. Uh, she, it was the lady that said that she remembers Labour from the 70s. Um, but, of course, the pensioners of today are the, the, the working people that were paying taxes in the 1970s. And they were paying taxes at 35% basic rates. And, and, and they'll remember that. They'll remember being screwed by a Labour government back in the day. But they're also the people that bought their council houses in the 1980s um, and comprehensively rejected Labour um, three times in a row during the 1980s. Only for Labour to come back into power and then get that famous 75p rise in pensions, mm. which again is just this relentless attack not just on pensioners, which it clearly is, but on this generation since they were young. And it's uh, quite a disparity so between this and uh, train drivers, nurses, teachers, and, and wait for it, the civil service. The civil service will be the next mob that decide they want 15 to 20% pay rises, they'll probably get it. Um, yes, so um, a, 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 another, another two-tier approach, I suspect, Richard, is what uh, we can expect. And, of course, we haven't even had the budget yet. Rumours are, and they are just rumours, that, uh, because Angela Rayner wouldn't deny this first element, is that uh, potentially the 25% council tax discount for single people, that might be taken away. Well, guess who that affects more than anybody? Pensioners. Uh, and also the fact that national insurance might be levied on top of earnings for pensioners. So, Richard, you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there is no... It's unequivocal. The evidence is there. Pensioners are being bashed. Yeah, this is... This is and all the things you just mentioned, this is why it's clearly a politically calculated move, because within it's callous, days... Richard. It's callous. Within days of, within days of Rachel Reeves uh, taking the reins of the Treasury, she announced uh, this this first announcement of removing the winter allowance um, other than the very, very, very poorest of pensioners. Um, but, of course, the people that will keep a Labour Party in government are the likes of the train drivers, the civil servants, what have you, which they're being placed in the top 5% of earners by getting these pay rises, yeah. but it's being paid for by the bottom 5% of earners yeah. with, the, with the poorest pensioners. So it's clearly a, a politically calculated move where it's going to inflict the least political damage on them. And unfortunately, it's the, 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 the pensioners that remember them from the 70s, that remember just how bad a Labour government can be, and they just don't... Care. No, they don't. Well, we're certainly remembering now, aren't we? Despite all of the, the platitudes and the smoke and mirrors, the mask that Keir Starmer wore on the way into the election, uh, there wasn't a peep about releasing prisoners early, was there? There wasn't a peep about immigrant amnesties or council tax discounts potentially being eradicated, nor indeed 10 million pensioners having their £300 winter fuel allowance taken away from them. So on the basis that those things weren't mentioned in the manifesto, uh, you Imagine if they were, if Keir Starmer and his Labour Party had been honest, they wouldn't have got elected. So I think we can conclude from that, Richard, if you agree with me, that they didn't mention these things because they realised they wouldn't get elected. So therefore they said things uh, that basically aren't true. It's fraud. It's electoral fraud. It's a lie to the electorate upon which Keir Starmer's got elected. Do you agree? Well, all, all political parties will use an element of sleight of hand, you know, in the, in the election campaign. But I agree with you in that these things were... It, it was a lie. You know, we, and we've all seen the, the films of Keir Starmer saying he's on the side of pensioners. We've seen the films of various um, MPs, including Angela Rayner and Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves, um, criticising the then Conservative government for even considering... Um, any impact on the winter fuel allowance. Yeah. So, and, and they come, you know, with the uh, with this. But of course, the 
we're talking about um, Labour's own research saying that this could kill 400 yeah, 4,000 4, 4, pensions. Yeah.